Sermon title this morning is Interracial Marriage, Right or Wrong. Now the title itself is going to have a couple words in it that many people are going to take offense at, right or wrong. We're living in a day and age right now where right and wrong is not popular. People have become so far removed from God's word that they don't like to be told that something is right or something is wrong. You've all heard the statements, oh, it's just relative, you know, it, it depends what's in your heart. One time I was accused by a group of church men at a meeting of seeing things black and white, and that was my problem, seeing things black and white. My position is, as you know, skunks are black and white. And there are a lot of skunks sitting out in church pews in 20th century Christianity today praying for colorblind preachers. And for the most part, their prayers have been answered because they have the preachers today that will talk on relative terms and things that are not offensive to the people and etc. Today, people feel that everything is relative. What might be right for one might not be for the other. And it's not very intellectual to label something right or wrong. The further society is removed from God's word, it changes from being unintellectual to call something right and wrong to being downright dangerous to call something right and wrong in front of different societies. And this is exactly what our society has done. It has perverted right and wrong dark and evil, black and white. Isaiah, the fifth chapter, a passage that you hear me use often because it applies to America, is a passage that is worth reading and getting into this particular subject, interracial marriage. In Isaiah 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are clever in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. The thing that's amazing to me in this situation that Isaiah is describing, which is exactly the situation we have today in the pulpits in our land today, is that not only do they call black, white, and right, wrong, and etc., but they think they're so smart. Everybody's so cockeyed intellectual today. You know, they're so wise in their own sight because they talk and they philosophize and God's word has said this is exactly the way it is, but they explain it all away and they're so intellectual. Now think about it. If this is society today, and if God's people today are in this lot of calling wrong right and right wrong, how is the preacher going to appear who comes along and calls wrong wrong and right right? How is he going to appear to such a society? He's going to be different, first of all. Peculiar, if you want to use the word. He may be even called names like crazy, radical, bigot. And guess what? Most preachers don't like to be labeled. They don't want to be unacceptable to their society. They are concerned about their ministry, you know, as to whether it grows. And I've had people say, well, you know, your problem is, isn't so much what you're saying, but your manner in the way you say it. And what they're really saying is, we wouldn't want to be like you because we wouldn't be very acceptable to our friends and to society and etc. There will be others who will say or wonder, why do you even preach on a subject in a racial marriage? Is it right or wrong? One of the reasons is I believe people deserve a biblical answer on the subject. And another reason is I'm not blind. In Isaiah's day, that's what he accused the leaders of being. In Isaiah, the 56th chapter, verse 10 and 11. Notice what it says. Isaiah 56, verse 10. His watchmen are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are dumb dogs, unable to bark, dreamers lying down who love the slumber. And the dogs are greedy. They are not satisfied. And they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each one to his own unjust gain to the last one. So here we see that the leaders, the religious leaders of his day, were blind. They couldn't see. And isn't that what we have today? Well, we don't see anything wrong with this and thus and so. We have men today that can't see anything wrong with homosexuality, just to give you one example. He said they're like dumb dogs, unable to bark. Think about it. How, how rich could we become if we could invent a dog or say we worked on some breedings for a dog and we come up with a new hybrid type of dog. Now, this thing is a dog that uh, is going to really be a new sensation on the market. It's a new type of watchdog. 
It's going to revolutionize the watchdog industry. You see, the new type of dogs that we have out there, they don't bark. That's right, they don't bark. Think about it. They're simply wonderful to have around. They never wake you up out of a dead sleep like the old-fashioned watchdogs did, you know, uncourteous type dogs. They never offend visitors who might be in your yard at 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that. You know, like the old-fashioned watchdogs were very offensive to people. They never disturb the neighbors. And you know how the old watchdogs would make people angry? Well, everyone loves these kind of little dogs. They rub up on you and slobber all over you. You know, this is the kind of watchdog that we had back in Isaiah's day, and that's the kind of watchman we have in America today because you'll find very few ministers speaking out about this thing called interracial marriage. They're blind, and they're like dumb dogs. They don't bark. Over in Ezekiel, the third chapter. In Ezekiel, the third chapter. We read verse 17 through 19 of the responsibility of a watchman. And it certainly is not to be blind. He said, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Why do I speak on this subject? Because I am not blind. I'm not deaf and dumb. I see a problem in the land of Israel today, America, that is not being addressed. No one is saying a word. And for any minister who I ever hear this message, I'm telling you that you have a responsibility as a watchman to God. When you see people involved in interracial marriage, you have a responsibility at least to find out whether or not it's right or wrong. Amen? At least to find that much out. But today, people don't touch the subject. You know, well, the important thing is Jesus and getting saved and all that. You know, another reason I preach on this subject because I prove my love to Christ when I tend to his sheep. It was Hosea who said, Hosea 4, verse 6, that his sheep or his people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now I ask you, what would you do if you saw people being destroyed? His people, your people. And that's what is happening today in regards to interracial marriage. Now the answer to the question, is interracial marriage right or wrong? There's really about three ways to answer the question. First of all, and probably the best, major leg that we want to stand on or rest this case upon is God's Word. We can go to God's Word to find the answer. Surely it's not silent on this thing. You know, after all, ministers are telling us that this tells us how to live and everything else. Well, does it say anything about interracial marriage? We at least ought to go to God's Word. Secondly, we can use some outward observation. There's nothing wrong with using the little gray matter that God gives you to and observe what's going on. There's nothing wrong with praying for wisdom, try to figure out whether or not uh, certain things are right. Outward observation as to whether it's beneficial or not. Beneficial to the people, to the world, or even to your offspring in a racial marriage. Thirdly is what I've labeled here instinctive knowledge. More common term is that gut feeling. Now certainly this is not something you want to hang your hat on entirely and I'll explain it more in a moment. Before I do though, let me say this. For some people it will not make any difference how we go in to study the God's Word and finding the answer, what the facts indicate. It will not make any difference how we answer the question, what the facts say, or what God's Word says, because they're going to do whatever they want to do. I'll give you an example. This has happened several times as a minister. I'll have a young lady come up to me, and she'll say, well, do you think there's anything wrong with dating a, an unchristian man, a man that's not a Christian? Now, she says that to me after she's been out on 10, 15 dates. She's emotionally involved. Now, you think it's going to do any good for me to say no? Do you? Not at all. And for those people who are dead set in regards to marrying someone of another race, it will make no difference. For those people who have already caught themselves up in that particular sin, and I will show you from the scriptures in this message, and we'll have to use another message too because there's that much in God's word on the subject. For those people, they're not going to want to see it. And I can't hardly blame them. But my job is to go ahead and tell you whether you like it or not. Some people, 
it will make no difference what you say because they are totally brainwashed. We're living in a brainwashed society where the opinion manipulators, the people that control our media and form the opinions of the people, they have totally changed their thinking. They've flushed out the brains of the average Christian people in the world today. The man can stand up in their congregation, it might be a black man, and he can say, I got a burden for my people. And everyone, oh, praise God, praise the Lord, isn't that wonderful? A white man stands up in his congregation and says, well, I have a burden for my people too. And they scowl at him. Why? What's the difference? The only difference is, is they have been conditioned. They have been totally conditioned in our society today, in the world today, that we have about us. It's all right, you know, they're called Jews, God's chosen people. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Praise God. God will bless you because you're blessing them and on and on you hear. But so suppose someone stands up and says, no, it's not those people. There's been a case of mistaken identity, but it's these people over here, the, the white Anglo-Saxon kindred people, etc. And again, oh, the scowls, the indignity, the, the hostility that comes at you. Why? Because they've simply been brainwashed. Well, first of all, let's approach this issue of interracial marriage from what I call instinctive knowledge that gut feeling. Now this is not, like I said, something you hang your hat on, or at least not something by itself, not without God's word to back it up, but it's still not something that you should discount either, because God has given it to you for your own preservation. First of all, turn over to Romans, the first chapter, in regards to this instinctive thing. In Romans, the first chapter, verse 19, we see some teaching on this. Probably should start with verse 18 since it begins the sentence. Reading from the New American Standard, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And that's what I want you to see is in verse 19 that certain men have something inside them about what is evident. That that is evident about God. If you turn over to Romans, the second chapter, verse 14 and 15, we see a little more on this subject. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatingly accusing or else defending them. Now I want you to see that the law of God has been put in the heart of God's people. Do you disagree? It's there. It's that thing we call instinct. You know, two boys can, can be little boys, and, and they've maybe never even gone to Sunday school, know nothing about God's Word, and they begin to fight over a toy, and the one boy says, I had that toy first. Well, what is it that makes him know that because he had it first, he should be able to have the toy? Nobody told him that. He just intuitively understood that's the way it ought to be. Let me illustrate how it works in the land and the world we're living in today. For the last couple of decades, the liberals have really worked very hard in convincing the people that one of the problems we had was the old Puritan ethic. The old Puritan ethic was causing people to have all kinds of sexual hang-ups and inhibitions and etc. Stating that, you know, this guilt feeling about sexual relationship outside of marriage was only as a result of the old Puritan ethic and we need to get our thinking straightened out. Yet, once upon a time, people intuitively knew in our land that relationships outside the marriage contract were wrong. No one had to be convinced that the marriage relationship was wrong. They knew it wasn't wrong. They knew it was right. A God-ordained institution. Today, the homosexuals are saying, well, you know, it's just an alternative lifestyle. There's nothing wrong which, cho which choice or which lifestyle you choose. They're trying to convince you that as they go around aiding America. You probably heard what gay stands for. Got AIDS yet? But they have worked very hard on the people to get them to accept this thing. Yet God has put within us intuitively that it's absolutely wrong. No one has to convince you that heterosexuality is right. Isn't that correct? You know intuitively it's right. There's not, no one has to do that, but they have to come along and they have to convince you that homosexuality is right 
Because intuitively, this law that God puts in your heart says it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And so it is with interracial marriage, my friend. Intuitively, people know it's wrong. When you see a black man and a white woman, or vice versa, waltz down the aisle in a wedding ceremony, something inside your gut says, that's not right. And you know it. You have to have society convince you. You have to have our world order today to, to show you that that is the end thing and etc. No one has to convince you that two whites walking down the marriage aisle is wrong or right. You know intuitively that it's right, it's natural. When two blacks are walking down the aisle to be married or two orientals, well, no one has to say that that is natural. You know that it's natural. Intuitively, we know it. And God has given us this intuitive thing for our own preservation. Think about it. You know, they've done studies with little babies. One study I remember reading about was a little baby laying there in his crib. And they take this shadow of a ball. Now, it's all it is is a shadow. And they are able, through the lighting, et cetera, to project that shadow of ball as it's coming down on the baby. And the baby, never having seen a ball before in its life, it turns its head to try to miss the ball, the shadow. Why? Because intuitively, for self-preservation, God has put within that child to turn away from an object coming at you. You see the relationship? And intuitively, God has told us, if you want to preserve your race, you stay away from interracial marriage. Next, and more importantly, let's go to God's Word. Now, first of all, I should say this, that it really is not going to be that effective for the modern 20th century Christian because he has, for some reason, been convinced that there is a different God in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. And thus he unconsciously discards three-fourths of God's Word, whether he admits it or not. He might carry it all around, he might go to church, he might be a Bible thumper and all, but unconsciously, or subconsciously, I should say, that he discards three-fourths of the Bible because he's convinced that he's got a New Testament God. However, the New Testament says in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes and forever. And so we are told that our Christ does not change. Also, the New Testament tells us, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. John 8, verse 58, Jesus said, Before Abraham was born, I am. And they picked up stones to kill him. Why? Because he was making himself equal with the great I am in Exodus, the third chapter, verse 14. And why shouldn't he? Because it says in John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, Jesus Christ is the great I am, and the great I am, the God of the Bible, never changes. He simply does not change. Now, get this. If you, little pious Christian, wherever you might be, if you claim to love Jesus Christ and you don't even know about the God of the Bible, the Old Testament, the great I am in the Old Testament, then you don't even know Jesus Christ. If you've never read about the great I am in the Old Testament, you don't know Christ. You don't even know who you're claiming allegiance to. What was the feeling of Jesus Christ in Genesis, the sixth chapter, where we read one of the first accounts of interracial marriage? Now, I say one of the first accounts. It is not the first account, but it's one of them. In Genesis, the sixth chapter, we have a very vivid description of the feeling of our God, of our Lord, in regards to interracial marriage. Genesis 6, starting with verse 1. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. So here we see that the sons of God were marrying the daughters of men. Now, because of time, we're not going to go into great detail as to who the sons of God were and who the daughters of men were. We have done that fairly well in regards to the true creation story, man and then Adam, a tape message that we have. But I believe that the sons of God were the descendants of Adam, and the daughters of men were the pre-Adamic race. 
However, because we want to stay on the subject this morning, rather than getting into proving that point, just suppose it's like many men say, that it was angels. Some men maintain that it was angels coming down out of heaven and that they were marrying the daughters of men. However, Jesus did tell us that, that the angels neither give nor take in marriage. However, many people take this position that the sons of God were these angels and they were coming down and marrying the daughters of men. My position, which I believe is a scriptural position, is that the sons of God were the Adamic race and the daughters of men the pre-Adamic race. But either way, think about it, either way, it was interracial marriage. Are not angels of another race? But it was interracial marriage. Didn't their union work? Didn't they have offspring? Certainly they did. You know, they had the ability to have physical union, but that didn't make it right, did it? They had the desire to be joined together, but that didn't make it right. They had the acceptance of society in Genesis, the sixth chapter, but that didn't make it right either. Here we see society completely perverted, calling good evil and evil good. There was only really one oddball out there that had enough guts to stand against this thing. And don't think he was not out there in the middle of the plains building a boat. His name was Noah. And notice what it says about Noah and why God chose Noah. You know, you know, you've heard the song, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But do you know why he found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Now, it wasn't because he was all that great of a saint, my friends. Because it wasn't very far on in the Bible, you'll find that he's basically involved in a drunken orgy. As I can tell, at least he was dead drunk in his tent. Isn't that correct? So it wasn't all that pure and righteous, but he found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he did not get involved, nor had his family been involved in interracial marriage. Genesis 6, verse 7. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard. The King James says grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Now I should be reading this morning from the King James for this particular passage because the New American Standard has not done very good justice here. But if you look at the footnotes in the New American Standard, it says that that Noah was a righteous man, that word blameless has a footnote which says complete or perfect in his time, and that time should be generations. And if you look up the word, it says that he was perfect in his generation. You look up the word generation, and it means lineage. It means seed. Noah was not a perfect man. I haven't found one yet, and neither have you. The scriptures show, obviously, that he was not. But he was perfect in his seed. Look up the word for yourself in the Strong's Concordance. What was going on? What is the whole context here in a racial marriage? And why was it that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord? Because he had not been involved in interracial marriage, nor had his forefathers. He was perfect in his lineage. In fact, you can look at scripture and you'll find that his lineage went all the way back to Adam. There was no corruption or adulteration of the bloodline. Notice that as we read Genesis, the sixth chapter, that the progeny showed signs of hybrid vigor here. It says in verse 4, the Nephilim was on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So now remember this. They're, they were there before the flood and they were there afterwards. It says when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. And in verse 5 it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So we see that more evil came upon the earth as a result of interracial marriage. We see that there was a certain amount of hybrid vigor. And by the way, this is just for free, but some night when you're watching television on local TV, on the news, you just watch and see the names of the people that are going into jail. Now you just analyze for yourself how many of those people are basically what the world has called half-breeds, or it used to call half-breeds. And it's interesting, you make that comparison with Genesis, the sixth chapter, and we see that when they started making this interracial marriage thing, violence increased on the face of this earth. We see that God has a feeling in regards to this matter. What was it? He wanted to destroy them. 
he was grieved that he'd even made them. Isn't that what it says? Well, now, he wouldn't destroy anyone today, would he? Because why? He's changed. You know, he's the God of the New Testament. My friends, he has not changed. You read the story in Genesis, the sixth chapter, and he destroyed that world order because of the interracial marriage. Let's go to another example in Scripture. That's in Numbers, the 25th chapter. Numbers 25, verse 6 through 11. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Mennonite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meetings. When Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the body, so the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. And those who died by the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. And I want you to see here that God was destroying these people. He had brought a plague upon them. Why? Because they had interracial marriage in their camp. But he wouldn't do that today, would he? There's no plagues going on today. You know, in certain respects, the heart disease and the cancer makes the bubonic plague look like herpes. That's what we got going on in America today is all kinds of plagues and evil coming upon our people. Now, let's talk about Phineas. Phineas stopped the plague of the Lord by going in and running a spear through the man that was involved in a relationship with the Midianite woman. Isn't that what it says? And the Lord stopped the plague. Do you think Phineas loved God? Do you think Phineas loved the people? I want to tell you, if you love people, you keep them from being destroyed. And if they are being destroyed for a lack of knowledge, you give them that knowledge. And any preacher that might hear this message, I hope that you understand that. You give them the knowledge about what interracial marriage is doing, what it has done to God's people in the past, and how God feels about it. Has God just simply destroyed the people without teaching them, or had he taught them regarding interracial marriage? Turn over to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, and you'll see that the God of the Bible that has never changed was very clear in his instructions to Israel regarding interracial marriage. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1 through 6. When the Lord your God shall bring you into the land where you are entering to possess it and shall clear away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God shall deliver them before you, and you shall defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. But thus you shall do to them, you shall tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and hew down their ashram and burn their graven images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God and the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, I will show you that this prohibition against interracial marriage was not just because of religious differences between the two that it had to do with genetics. Some people maintain that this prohibition in Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, verse one through six, was because of religion and not because of race. And by the way, I can understand how they would come to this conclusion at first without doing any study or thought on the matter, but I think I can show you how that this is not the case. First of all, let's acknowledge that it is partially true for right in the text, the Lord said, if you intermarry with them, 
they're going to turn your sons away from following me and get your sons to follow other gods. So we see here that it is in the text that he did not want them to interracially marry because of religious differences. But was it due to culture or genetics? Was he afraid that they would pull the people away, his people, from serving another god because of culture or because of genetics? Notice the answer can be found by analyzing the text. In verse 2, he said that you shall utterly destroy them. Now the Lord told the Israelite people to go in and to conquer the seven nations that were in the land that God had given to them and that they were utterly to destroy them. Now, did that not mean every man, woman, and child? Think about it. Why shouldn't the Lord say, save the little ones three years and younger? Because they haven't been affected by the religion. Or may, why didn't the Lord say, save the children, you know, two years or a year and a half? You know, little babies certainly aren't affected by the culture. Why didn't the Lord say, save them, and then you can train them up in the ways of the Lord? You know, today it's a real big deal to have a sports car for a white couple to have a sports car and a slanted eye baby or a kinky haired little black child. Now, there's nothing wrong against yellow children or black children. Don't get me wrong. But the point is, is that the opinion manipulators, the media are trying to make it look like the end thing for the white people to go out and adopt other children of a different race. Well, if it was so great and so wonderful and so righteous and so Christian, why didn't the Lord have the Israelites do it right there and save all those little babies? Now, you think about it. Don't you think it has merit? Sure. Certainly it has merit. The truth of the matter is, it wasn't their idolatrous religion. It was genetics. God said that they were a holy seed. God did not want the holy seed to mingle with the other people. Now, I know that that will bring the wrath of the society down upon me as a preacher to ever have the audacity to bring that out, but it's scriptural. Look at verse 6. It says, For you are a holy people, or it means a holy seed. And there we see that, that God considered the Israelite people something holy. Now, turn over to Ezra, the ninth chapter. By the way, while we're turning there, I might state that one of the reasons our people are having to adopt people of other races simply because our race is killing off our babies. There are no babies out there to adopt unless you want a, a baby of a different race. Ezra, the ninth chapter, starting with verse 1. Now, when these things have been completed, the princes approached me, saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. According to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Now, so what was the problem here? They had taken these people of the other nations as their, as their wives. Now, the very thing that God forbidden them to do in Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, verse 2. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race, or seed, the holy seed, has intermingled with the people of the land. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. So do you not see the sin clear over in Ezra, a long time after Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter, has been written? These people were involved in interracial marriage. Now, they did not allow themselves to be separate. Let me ask you something. Did this man of God, Ezra, believe in segregation or integration? Hey, Christian people, what does your Bible say? Forget what the world says is right or wrong. What does the Bible say? God's Word. There, he was saying, be separate. Exactly. Segregation was the thing then. Look at his own words and you'll see in verse 2 that he called them the Holy Seed. Now, if it was just idolatrous religion that he was concerned about, he didn't want them intermarrying because of their religion, then the remedy would not be so drastic. The remedy, as we look at in chapter 10 of, of Ezra, was a very drastic remedy. Notice what he said to them, verse 3 of Ezra 10. 
So now let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. So Ezra said, according to the law, according to the counsel of my Lord, this is what you do to remedy this situation. I didn't write this, I just preach it. He said, you put away your wives and your children. Now, if the Lord was only concerned about, about the religion, he could have said this, well, save your little kids, send your wives away because they'll, they'll send you into an idolatrous religion, but save the little kids, your own children, and you can raise them up. Now, doesn't that seem reasonable? Isn't that something that he could have done? But he didn't do that. It was genetics. God did not want the holy seed to mingle. But then again, of course, he's changed, right? In the New Testament, he has no holy seed, does he? He has no holy people. Oh, really? Turn over to 1 Peter, the second chapter. 1 Peter, the second chapter. Reading from the New American Standard, verse 9 and 10. Who was Peter writing to? It tells us. But you are a chosen race. Now, for all the people who say we take the Bible for what it says, just remember it says here a holy race. If you have the King James translation, it says generation, just like it said generation back there in the days of Noah, and it means race, it means lineage, it means seed. And he was writing to a holy or a chosen race. It says a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I know how I once believed this. That this was, quote, the Gentiles. And now they were came, coming to this faith that the Jewish people had or coming to the God that the Jewish people had, etc. But if you cross-reference this, you'll find that this is fulfillment of prophecy in Hosea 1, verse 10, dealing with the people of Israel, that they were going to be brought back into the Holy Covenant. And they were still a holy seed. And we read in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 1 and 2, that he was writing to a chosen people who had been scattered. And if you turn over to James, the first chapter, verse 1, you'll find that James was writing to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. James and Peter was writing to the very same people, the Israelite people of Scripture who are today the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and kindred people. And we have a holy seed on the face of this earth today that is mingling their seed like it's the end thing with the other races. In fact, the Pepsi commercials are telling us the new generation is what? You just look at the commercials sometime and you'll find very few white people in there. You see the planners for a new world order, the authorities of Babylon have a plan. They want not only a one world government, but they also want a one world race. Whitey, you are an endangered species. Like it or not. Why? Because we've come a long ways, baby. A long ways from God's word. Who is, that's clearly taught us time after time. Interracial marriage is wrong. Turn to Genesis, the 12th chapter. In Genesis, the 12th chapter, we find God speaking to his man, Abram. Whose name was later changed to Abraham. And he's telling Abraham, or Abram, to leave his country. Now, Without, maybe because of time, just looking at all the scriptures there, you can read it sometime. Genesis, the 12th chapter, God tells Abram to leave his country. Now, the commentaries tell us that his country was full of idolaters, and that his countrymen and his own family, they were idolaters, but Abraham was not. And if you look at Genesis, the 24th chapter, verse 3, we find this Abraham now wanting to find a, a, a wife for his son. In Genesis 24, verse 3, he's speaking to his servant, and he says, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. So we see here that Abraham was concerned. Concerned about what? That his son not get involved in interracial marriage. Why, what's the matter, Abraham? You think you're too good for the Canaanites? You know, after all, God loves all the races, and there's no difference. I'm telling you, the scriptures say that Abraham was a man of God. 
that he followed God's laws and his statutes and judgments, as I'll show you here in a minute. And one thing that this godly man was concerned about was that his son not have interracial marriage. You call him a bigot, you call him whatever you want, but I know what God's word calls him faithful. His people that he sent his servant back to were of the same race. Now, they were idolaters. I'm still dealing with this subject where a lot of people think that interracial marriage in the Old Testament was simply because of religion. Why the people back there that he was sending his servant to, Eliezer to, were idolaters. But yet he's had his servant go back and get a wife for his son Isaac from idolaters people. Do you follow my reasoning? Why did Abraham do this? Look at Genesis 26, verse 5. This is particularly for those that think, oh, Abraham was living in the twilight era of knowledge. It says in Genesis 26, verse 5, Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Why did Abraham want a wife for his son that was of the same race? Because he was keeping the law of God. And by the way, it was around a long time before Moses. And by the way, it's still around a long time after Moses, even though the ministers are saying it's been nailed to the cross. Going on with our reasoning, note Genesis, the 27th chapter, verse 46. Here we read the story about Abraham's son, Isaac. He's very old now. And now he has a son by the name of Jacob. Genesis 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? And so here we see the situation as that Esau had taken a daughter of Heth. He had got involved in interracial marriage. And by the way, can you not see the anguish that it was causing with his mother, Rebecca? You just watch it sometime, the families that get involved in interracial marriage, and you just see how the family becomes divided because it's not natural to begin with. Now, verse 1 of Genesis 28. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Perdan Aram, to the house of Bethula, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So again, we see that Isaac does the same thing about Jacob that Abraham had done for Isaac. He wanted to make sure that Jacob got a wife that was of the same race. Are you all with me? But... I'm here to tell you that those people that he sent him back to were idolaters. If you turn over to Genesis, the uh, 31st chapter, we can see this proven from Scripture. In Genesis 31, verse 30, he says, And now you have indeed gone away because you long greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Least you take... Uh, your daughters from me by force, the one with whom you find your God shall not live in the presence of our kinsmen. Point out what is yours among my peoples, among my belongings, and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And you know the story, if you've read this at all, is that Rachel had taken some idols from her father's house, and she was sitting on them. You can read the story there, but the point I want to point out is that they were idolaters. He got a wife from a house who... The head of the household was an idolater. The point being is interracial marriage didn't just have to do with religion. Here we see the religion Rachel came from was an idolatrous religion, but the Lord had Jacob marry her, but she was of the same race. Does it make sense? I teach my children, don't you ever plan on marrying anyone outside of your race. Don't you ever date anyone outside of your race. In fact, don't you ever even think about it. Why? Because the law of my God forbids it. And he's your God too. And I teach them also that if they ever did such a thing, never to come around my house with their mate or their half-breed children because they've been traitors to their own sires. 
Now, I know that some will react to that. Oh, that's awful. That's racist. That's bigot. That really hurts. Why well, I can hardly stand to hear a man like yourself say that. But I know one thing. I'm keeping company with some of the finest men in Scripture. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ezra. I'm not concerned what the world calls me. I'm simply concerned what God's Word says. You know, God does have feelings on this matter. Now, if you think that Abraham... Isaac and Ezra dreamed this up on their own. I want you to notice Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter, verse 2, which shows God's feeling on this matter. Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. And by the way, I want to say that the translators of the New American Standard have done very good in many different areas, and Christian people should never use just one translation, but they have really adulterated it in this verse, verse 2. I shall read it to you how they have it first of all. No one of illegitimate birth shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Now, if you have the King James translation, does anyone have it here? It says bastard, does it not? Now, what has happened is that our language has changed. Today, our language, when we hear the word bastard, means someone of an illegitimate birth, a child born out of wedlock, if you will. But at the time of King James, it did not mean that. It meant someone that was a half-breed, that had two different parents, or two different races. And so this word illegitimate was a very big mistake on the part of New American Standard, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if maybe the Antichrist forces were involved in getting that word put in, because they've been very effective in the last several centuries, or at least the last century, of getting our minds changed on this. But if you look up the word, if you look up the Hebrew word, it's a word that means mongrel. I believe the Hebrew word is mamzer, and it's 4464 in Strong's Concordance, if you want to look that up, 4464. This is what it means, mongrel. That's Jewish father and heathen mother. It meant something different than illegitimate birth. A mongrel. Isn't that what we talk about, a mongrel pup? Well, here we see that God's feelings on the matter was that a bastard, that a mamzer, that a mongrel, that a half-breed, they are all synonymous, my friends. I didn't write this. I only preach it. That they were not to be allowed in the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth generation. Now, if this meant illegitimate birth, as some people would like to have it, that would mean that David couldn't even go to the temple of the Lord. Why? Because you'll find that David's lineage went back to Tamar and Judah. And Tamar had an illegitimate relationship with Judah, and she had two illegitimate children, twins. And David was from that lineage, and it hadn't even been ten generations yet. But yet we see David could go into the house of the Lord, so it wasn't talking about illegitimate children, it was talking about mongrelized children, and the word itself bears it out. What sin, my friends, ever brought down God's wrath and destruction? One, we have homosexuality, Sodom and Gomorrah being an example, or the tribe of Benjamin being an example. The other is interracial marriage. We see God destroyed it in the flood. He also destroyed it in the book of Numbers. And then someone comes along and says, well, yes, but what about the New Testament? Well, we shall get to the New Testament, but we're not going to be able to get too far in it today because of time. We'll cover that in our next message. But I want to tell you this, that the New Testament clearly says that Jesus came to save his people, which we are, from their enemies. And our enemies have been very active in our land in trying to get our people involved in interracial marriage because that is one way you destroy people. It's nothing new. Pharaoh did it. If you read the story of the children of Israel uh, in the book of Exodus, the first chapter, you'll find that the children of Israel were more and mightier than the Egyptians, by the way, but the Egyptians were able to convince the children of Israel to take their children and throw them in the River Nile. And Pharaoh only had them throwing in the male babies. Now, I was always puzzled on that. I thought, why didn't he have them throw in the female babies? After all, it's the female babies that have more babies. Well, if you got rid of all the male babies, what would the female babies, uh, Israelite babies, marry? 
someone outside their race. And then he could homogenize them right into his culture. Why do you suppose that Moab got the Israelites involved in interracial marriage in Numbers, the 25th chapter, verses 17 through 18? In fact, the book of Jasher does even a better job of describing the reason why. And the reason was that they wanted to destroy the Israelites. And they didn't think they could do it any other way, but if they could get them involved in interracial marriage, that would do it. And why do you suppose our government today that is controlled by antichrist forces, they're not for Christianity as a whole, they are part of this Babylonian system, why do you suppose they push so hard for integration? Why do you suppose they let the illegal aliens come across our borders, not putting out any more guards across the border of Mexico than they have around the White House? It's not been by accident. Why do you suppose the media promotes half-breeds? Why do you suppose the singing idols that our children have today are a bunch of half-breed jungle bunnies dancing around in the lights? Why do you suppose that the new generation commercials aren't showing very many white people? Why do you suppose they promoted the Archie Bunker image? And that's what they've put me into when they hear a sermon like this that would have anything to do with concerning, being concerned about his own race. Why? Because, my friends, I'm here to tell you that even the New Testament teaches that Jesus' people still have enemies and they want to destroy us. As we go on in part two of this message, I shall show you from the New Testament how clearly it teaches against interracial marriage. We'll look at the passage in Deuteronomy where God said you're not even to have a foreigner, someone of another race, to be put in charge above you. I here to tell you, and I think I can prove it scripturally. Now, I realize that the people that hear this are going to take great offense, but even having a black mayor of a city is wrong and contrary to God's word. Amen. In fact, the Bible says, woe, when you have such people rule over you. We'll look in scripture, and we'll find out the sin that the New Testament and the Old says totally destroys the body. So what you've heard has been part one, interracial marriage, is it right or wrong? Let's stand and we'll close with the song. It's an easy one to sing. Sometimes it's a little harder to do. Father in heaven, we acknowledge that if we would but live and honor your word, that things would be so much happier in our lives and in the lives of the people of the world, of all the races and the nations. Father, we long for that great day when righteousness shall reign upon the earth. 
Your kingdom shall be fully manifest and will not have the evil fornicators and adulterers about our midst. Father in heaven, I pray for your blessings upon the words that have been preached this morning. We know how difficult they'll be to be accepted by so many people across our land. We pray for your spirit to come into the lives of our people, that you'd open their eyes, remove their blindness, that you'd cause their watchmen to begin to cry out, that we might see that even our God who has never changed has destroyed worlds and orders and people because of this very sin. Father, I pray that you'd send upon us a spirit of repentance. You'd forgive us and our people and this evil thing that has come into our land. Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.